Yes, I think this time is coming and we will start now. Please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first joint WCRP and WWP webinar series on Global Monsoon. My name is Wu Shanyin from WCRP and WWP Secretary in Geneva, where I work with International Monsoon Project Office in India to support global monsoon activity among the WCRP and WWRP. Surya Rao from India Institute of uh, Tropical Meteorological here will be a more we talk with me. So over to you, Surya. Thank you, Ushan. Uh, good morning uh, to all my European colleagues. Good afternoon to Asian colleagues. Good evening to US colleagues who are uh, particularly from Hawaii. Uh, to all the speakers and participants and hosts. I am Sul Chandra Rao, working at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. I am co-chairing the Monsoons panel with Laila Karwalal. I welcome all of you to this first joint WCRP WWRP webinar series on monsoons. The Monsoons panel is a joint panel of Clever GX core projects of WCRP. It actively promotes various activities of improving understanding, simulation, and prediction of monsoons. To enhance outreach activities, the panel is organizing a series of webinars on global monsoon and regional monsoons with the kind support of WRP and WWRP. In this first session, we will cover topics relevant to global monsoons, and in subsequent sessions, we will cover regional monsoons, Asian, Australian, American, and African monsoons. These recorded webinars will be available to the Monsoons community through the Monsoons panel webpage and from WCRP, WWRP web platforms. All the attendees are encouraged to type in their questions to the speaker in Q&A section of this Zoom. And the speakers will answer the same during the question and answer session at the end of both the talks. If time is insufficient, to answer all the questions during this session, the speakers kindly agreed to reply to your questions offline as well. So, WWRP also co sponsors, uh, along with WCRP and MOS, the International Monsoon Project Office at IITM. That is the project office dedicated for monsoons panel activities and WWRP activities related to monsoons. Now, I will just briefly introduce you what is the monsoons panel structure and its activities. So I will share my screen. So you can see my screen, correct? So yes. proper monsoons, the webinar. And so when it comes to Cliver GX monsoons panel, it actually covers both global monsoons and regional monsoons domains. As you can see from this figure, there are globally there are different monsoon regions, the American, American monsoons, both North American and South American monsoon, African monsoons, North Africa, North, Northern African and Southern African or West African monsoon, Asian national monsoon. So these three different major monsoon systems and together with global, that is what the monsoon panel activities are uh, focusing on. So here, uh, Dr. Laila Carvalho from USA and myself are co-chairing this monsoon panel. And the panel's main overarching goal is that advancing understanding of monsoon variability and improving its prediction with observations and modeling as cornerstones of research activities. So we use both models and observations to enhance the both predictions and the variability of monsoon understanding of it. So the other uh, goals are to try to emphasize on various linkages across scales from spatially and from global to regional and also the time uh, from synaptic to the climate scale, how these interactions happens and what are the physical processes involved in these things. And also, we always seek for new methods to enhance the monitoring, advanced diagnostics, and improve models. Actually, Monsoon's panel actively gets involved in various RCOPs, Regional Climate Outlook Forums, to help the NMHS 
or the national metrology centers to understand what are the limitations of the models and what are the diagnostic tools to be used such a way we get directly or to research to operations activities also amongst the panelists involved in very much. So we also uh, develop various uh, process studies coordinated with modeling activities and understanding what are the bottlenecks in the present model uh, state of art models in giving us improved skills for a different time scales. And last but the least, empowering the next generation of scientists. Actually, this activity is also intended for that purpose. Next generation around the world to advance our knowledge of monsoon systems, in particular in key regions of interest. So this webinar series will become part of that activity as well. So as I mentioned in the beginning itself, we have about uh, 60 members actively involved in monsoons panel in various uh, working groups as well as the main panel. So as I mentioned, we have three working groups on Asian National Monsoon. About 17 members are there in that Asian National Monsoon working group. Ilma team and they are co-chairing this uh, working group. And there's American Monsoons uh, working group. There's Ellis and Ruth are the co-chairs, which has about 15 members. And working group on African Monsoons is a very big uh, group, 24 members. Was, uh, actually, it is chaired by Ron Roy, Fiona, and Akino. Oh, we so total, we have about 60 members actively involved in looking at both regional and global monsoon aspects. So the present focus of this panel at present, what we are focusing on that to assess the skill of dynamical models in simulating rainfall and regional monsoons and identify what are the bottlenecks for further improvement. That is the major activity that is going on in the monsoons panel at this moment. So we also are trying to understand uh, the dynamical and physical process and with extreme events. That is one very important area where uh, to understand how do we uh, improve the prediction skill of the models in capturing these extreme events. That is one of the very active research area. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we also have research to operations activities to help the regional outlook forums and operational methods services. In fact, there are some regions where monsoon uh, area and onsets are not yet well defined. So the panel is helping these med centers to come up with some guidelines on how to do that as well. Also, communicate existing products and provide guidance on their uh, applications and limitations, focusing on operational and what are the you know, different uh, impacts that will have on communities. These activities also are taking up, taken up by the panel at this moment. And one of the uh, very important uh, activities, capacity building. Particularly, we, out of the 60, maybe 50% of the people are early career scientists, which are actively involved in the monsoon panel activities in various working groups as well as in the panel. So if we can you look at well, the working group uh, on Asian National Monsoon, at present, this working group is looking at three important uh, focus areas. One is on monsoon process and teleconnections, how and why the model's prediction skill is limited in some regions and what is actually the reason for a limited skill. That is what is this uh, group is, subgroup is looking at it. And R2O for monsoon seasons in Southeast Asia, that is research to operations in Southeast Asia, that is one other activity that is the support is looking at. And high impact weather events, wherein extreme uh, rainfall events and prediction and what bottlenecks and processes involved in it is looked at by this uh, subgroup. So, African monsoons has also has a three different uh, subgroups, West African monsoon, Central African monsoon, and Southeast African monsoons. They are looking at this, and also it has become a very active working group at present. Similarly, American monsoons look at uh, three different North American, South American, and Central American monsoons. So we are also actively involved in organizing OSC, you know, Open Science Conference of WCRP, these are the different details. I don't want to read them and take uh, more time. So 
we are organizing several poster clusters. The panel members are organizing yeah, one session on global and regional monsoons. And also there are several sessions on posters, clusters on extremes, uh, rainfall and temperatures over India. Uh, so there are, I don't want to go in more detail, but we are actually involved in OSC. So what are our plans for 2023 and beyond? So as I mentioned, we are also now spearheading the OSC concept paper on global and regional monsoons. So the major focus that we are putting on this concept of is that prediction of monsoons in warming climate. What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? That is what is across different scales we'll be looking at it. And that is the concept of that work is going on at this moment. And we are also involved, as you know, yeah, at present you can see that WCRP, WRB, Webinar Series also we are actually getting involved. And we also have very strong uh, uh, Cross panel activities with click project, spot project, and different uh, uh, aspects as well. So, with this brief background, and I want to tell you that the monsoons panel is the only uh, panel that has a project office dedicated for this because it is uh, work with different organizations starting from WCRP, WDLP, Clive, and GOX. And it is actually headed by a lot of support is provided by uh, executive head again as well for, for this project office. So thanks for your attention. And without any further delay, I wanted you to go uh, for here. This is the first talk. So before that, I'll just introduce the our speaker. Let me. So our today's speaker is the uh, first speaker is Professor Bin Wang, and actually he is uh, such a stalwart in the monsoons research, and you don't need much of introduction, but as custom demands, so I will give you some details about him. So Professor Bin Wang is an emeritus scientist, uh, professor of atmosphere at the University of Hawaii, and the International Pacific Research Center. He obtained his PhD from FSU in 1984 and has published more than 650 papers in the last 40 years with citations that are really impressed anyone is that the total number of citations for his papers are about 65,000 with an H index of 100. So all of us actually look to him to achieve such goals, but it is very impossible task for many of us. So he received several awards. To name a few, Bin Wang was elected fellow of the American Meteorological Society in 2009 and elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2013. He received the Carl Gustav Crosby Research Medal in 2015 for creating insights leading to important advances in understanding tropical and monsoonal process and their capability. It is interesting to note that he also served as a co-chair of WCRP, WWF, uh, WCRP Clever GX Asian National Monsoon Panel from 2005 to 2009. Actually, this monsoons panel is a recent author of that same Asian National Monsoon Panel that was there earlier. So Professor Wang is a noted meteorologist specialized in climate and atmospheric dynamics and has pioneered greater understanding of the dynamics and capable of tropical climate and global monsoons in the Asian Pacific region. Today, we'll be talking about global monsoon response to external forcing and internal feedbacks. Professor Bin Wang, it is really a great pleasure that you have accepted our invitation. And now you can please start your talk. Thank you. OK, thank you, Dr. Rao. Um, Good morning, good evening, or good, or good afternoon, everybody. Accept my greetings from Hawaii. I want to thank the organized uh, webinar committee for invitation. This is going to be a discussion of the global monsoon concept and its response to anthropogenic forcing, as well as the internal feedback processes. 
I want to start to discuss the emerging concept of global monsoon. We know monsoon is characterized by the annual reverse of wind. So start from 1908, a German scientist Hans, they are trying to delineate the monsoon domain by, by wind. However, the results is only uh, for the Asian Australian monsoon regions, and there are many other problems. But the monsoon is also characterized by contrasting rainy summer and the dry winter. The monsoon rainfall has the greatest impact on the human and the society. And uh, <clears throat> the monsoon rainfall also plays essential role in determining atmospheric general circulation and the hydrological cycle. So from those perspectives, uh, uh, it is an advantage to look at monsoon from the rainfall perspectives. Um, the early attempt to uh, delineate a global monsoon domain is using OLR. And the dark green area shown here is the monsoon regions, not only over the land, but also over the uh, ocean regions. The domain extends from the Asian Australian monsoon to the uh, Western Hemisphere. So using the more accurate precipitation data, uh, we now can propose a very simple criteria. For example, the annual range must be higher than 300 millimeters. And the local summer precipitation exceeds 55% of annual total precipitation. Therefore, we can outline those monsoon regions. And there are main, mainly eight regional monsoon component uh, in terms of this uh, definitions. I think Dr. Roy has showed uh, similar figures before. So what is a global monsoon? If we do uh, UF analysis, the leading mode of annual variation of precipitation and low level winds is shown in the upper panel. So apparently this is a hemispheric anti-symmetric mode. In summer, rainfall in the Northern Hemisphere monsoon and, and winter is August. Now, therefore, uh, from climate perspective, we can define the global monsoon as the dominant mode of annual variation of the global tropical precipitation and the circulation. The physical essence, however, it is a forced response of the coupled atmosphere ocean land system to annual cycle of solar uh, insulation. The second definition is generic. It can apply to a geological time scale when the ocean land configuration dramatically different from today. And it also established a basis for understanding the astronomical theory of monsoon climate change, the Milankovitch cycle, the 20,000, 40,000, and 100,000 years of periodicity. Anyway, next I want to emphasize that the global monsoon plays a pivotal role in atmospheric general circulation and the hydrological cycle. For instance, look at how does it relate to the ITCZ. The blue curve is the ITCZ location during August. The red is in February. The ITCZ basically consists of two parts. One is the monsoon converging zones, which migrate largely north from north-south directions. And another is a trade wind converging zone, which is a quasi-stationary, doesn't move much. So two thirds of the IPCC actually is a monsoon converging zone. Therefore, uh, I would argue that the monsoon annual cycle drives ITCC's north, north south, south movement. And uh, the global monsoon also play a very important role in driving the hardest circulations annual variation. This figure shows upper level 200 hylopascal divergence wind. Those red arrows is called the lateral monsoon by Webster et al., which forms the backbone of the hardest circulation, the zonal mean meridional circulation. And it also has those transverse monsoons connect the monsoon and the desert subtropical high regions. And more importantly, the monsoon and the desert is a coupled system. For example, if you look at the Northern hemisphere, 
we add all rainfall in the monsoon region, those green regions together, we can have a curve, which is a black annual variations. And uh, <clears throat> if we also add the rainfall over the desert area, we get another blue lines. Basically, they are auto face on the interannual time scale. And in longer time scale, they are also has a different trend of the trends. So this couple system suggests that uh, monsoon enhanced monsoon means uh, more dry, drier this uh, uh, arid air regions. Of course, there is a theoretical background for that. For time being, I cannot uh, um, go into details. Okay, now next I want to focus on the how the global monsoon land rainfall responds to anthropogenic forcing. Uh, major reference paper is the monsoon uh, specialist team. They have a meeting in 2019 and made a re review report, monsoon climate change assessment, published the Bulletin American Meteorological Society. And there are other two papers talking about the mechanism, the process determine the global monsoon precipitation future change and eight regional monsoon change. So the most, the most uh, confidential projection is uh, increase of the extreme rainfall in the future and the floodings. One example is the urbanization effect. This figure shows the Yangtze River Delta regions. If you divided those regions to uh, urban stations, the red dot, and the rural stations, the blue dot, you see not only the temperature trend is higher, but also the extreme rainfall event, heavy precipitation rate is also higher. Obviously, that the urbanization has caused a significant rise in the intensity and the frequency of the extreme event. For the eight monsoon regions, they have a different response to the anthropogenic force and cause of global warming. This is showing the precipitation sensitivity. One degree global warming, how much percentage of global monsoon rain, land rainfall? Uh, increase for North Africa, South America, East Asia, West Pacific, North America. So this is Northern Hemisphere, and this is Southern Hemisphere, three regions. And for local summer, local winter, and annual mean. So overall, you see the Northern Hemisphere monsoon is enhanced, but the Southern Hemisphere monsoon in future does not change much, mainly because the Southern Hemisphere local winter monsoon will decrease significantly. This decrease is because the northern hemisphere summer monsoon increase. So the north and south anti-symmetric mode is related. And in the northern hemisphere, the main uh, uh, increase is in the eastern hemisphere. The North American monsoon tends to be lower. So it's an even distribution. So the question is why different region has different uh, increase in rate. For example, East Asia has the highest rate which is about a 5% increase per one degree of warming. Next is the Indian monsoon, but North American monsoon is, is opposite. So to understand this, a simple theoretical framework for attribution of the precipitation change is this moisture conservation. If we take a two layer, two layer model approximations, you end up with this formula. The change in the precipitation determined by local uh, evaporation, horizontal advection of moisture, most importantly, is the vertical advection of the moisture. This is a low level specific humidity, 500 millibar vertical motion. So you can see that there are three factors important. One is vertical motion, low level convergence. Another is static stability because static stability affect the vertical motion. Uh, the third factor, of course, is the moisture in the low level. What will happen if we look at the humidity in all monsoon regions during summertime, they increase uniformly 
about 8% per one degree of global warming. If you look at the static stability, they all increase and uniformly so that the uniform change of thermodynamic factors cannot explain the difference between Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, the difference between the North American monsoon and the Asian Australia monsoon. And another thing is that uh, the stabilization of atmosphere has the opposite effect as it increase the specific humidity. So what explains the regional difference is the pattern. The pattern induced by anthropogenic forcing is characterized by the northern hemisphere warmer than southern hemisphere. Therefore, it favors northern hemisphere monsoon increase, but decreases southern hemisphere monsoon. Second feature is land monsoon, land warming much more than ocean. So for the Asian Australia monsoon, North Africa monsoon, because of the huge Eurasian land warming, it will be enhanced. And the third factor is the Equatorial Pacific SST, which is uh, uh, El Nino-like global warming projected by CMIP-6 model. This will reduce the North American monsoon in this region. So in summary, the greenhouse gas radiated forcing has thermodynamic effect, increased moisture, favoring increased precipitation, on the other hand, it induced top heavy heating, stabilized atmosphere, reduced the vertical motion. So the weakening, the precipitation increase. So this two thermodynamic effect is cancel each other. Their net effect tends to be small, okay? Now, that is why the global monsoon increase much less than the uh, specific humidity like, like uh, predicted by the classes collab pattern equations, 8% per degree of global warming. And the regional difference can only uh, explain by the dynamic effect. This is due to the horizontal differential heating. Northern hemisphere are warmer than southern hemisphere, are land warmer than ocean, El Nino-like warming. So it can explain the regional difference. So this is the overall picture. In the literature, the people call this moisture effect as a thermodynamic effect. So I suggest that you have to call them moisture effect because thermodynamic effect include this static stability change, which is also a prominent term and they cancel each other. The last part I want to talk about the variability due to internal feedback processes. In general, this multi-decadal variation has a longer scale. Therefore, they have a larger scale. They are coherent at the hemispheric scale or global scale. And if we talk about the interannual variabilities, we have to look at the regional monsoons. Of course, there is a global aspect to look at. I will go into detail. The intra-season variability, each region has different driving processes. So let me first, uh, review this multi-decadal variation. Um, for example, the Northern Hemisphere summer monsoon in the last 100 years has multi-decadal variations. And they tend to be has a uniform. Uh, if you use no, the entire Northern Hemisphere land monsoon rainfall as an indices, it is a, a good representation of multi-decadal variability. So what determine those total amount of land monsoon rainfall? Now, this regressed figure shows that in the Pacific, increased rainfall corresponding to the Eastern Pacific triangle cooling and the West Pacific, this cache-shaped warming, those can be uh, form an extended ENSO index, which is similar to the IPO index. Now, Another factor is over the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. You see the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere contrast. And therefore, you can use North, um, North Atlantic warming versus the southern Indian Ocean cooling to make another index. There's two index related to the global northern hemisphere monsoon rainfall very well. Basically, a large portion of the uh, per, uh, 
variability can be explained by those combination of those two factors. And these two factors basically see internal variability. For example, if we take a, a couple GCM, fixed external forcing, external forcing has not, is fixed. Just due to internal variability, you can have this type of uh, North Hemisphere monsoon rainfall pattern and the corresponding uh, SST anomaly patterns. So it's uh, largely speaking, it's uh, internal variability, uh, not the external force. In uh, speak of the inter any variations, uh, we, we thought each region is different. Indeed, this is the case. For example, this North Hemisphere JJAS, look at the India monsoon. North African monsoon, uh, uh, North American summer monsoon, and West Pacific summer monsoon use their precipitation in index correlated with SST. You can see that uh, no matter is the Northern Hemisphere summer or Southern Hemisphere summer monsoon, to some extent they are related to the Pacific, but also related to the North Atlantic, sometimes the Indian Ocean. Different region, of course, has a different emphasis. But you can see that the ENSO is the biggest signal. So uh, to summarize, I want to make some remarks. Over the past 55 years, all regional summer monsoons have non-stationary relationship with ENSO, except Australia monsoon. So although they are linked, but this relationship is, is un unstable. Since 1970s, the regional monsoon ENSO relationship has been generally enhanced, except the Indian summer monsoon. But the Indian summer monsoon after 2000 is a bounce back, okay? However, regardless of the large regional difference, the monsoon precipitation over land area of all tropical monsoon region are significantly correlated with ENSO. This has been shown by this correlation uh, figures. The red curve is the Nino 3, point for SST uh, index. The green curve is Northern Hemisphere summer monsoon rainfall. Over the past 42 years, their correlation is minus 0.73, suggesting that ENSO drives the overall Northern Hemisphere summer monsoon, land monsoon rainfall. For Southern Hemisphere monsoon, summer monsoon, the correlation is slightly lower, mainly due to the recent two years they, they are reverse the correlation. Otherwise, is about the same 0.7, okay? Now, the last part, briefly uh, talking about the intra-seasonal variability, then you have to look at the region to regions. For example, there is a high-frequency intra-seasonal variation, eight to 20 days, and there is also low-frequency, 20 to 70 days. In, in the uh, monsoon regions, this is the leading UF mode patterns in each of the region for high frequency and the low frequency. The process affect this high frequency uh, partly from the equatorial couple uh, moist waves, like uh, Ross Bay waves, sorry. And the Rossby wave also affect North American monsoon, and some of them are the equatorial uh, coupled uh, Yanai wave affect West Africa, uh, high frequency ASV. Over East Asia, there is a middle latitude wave train impact. Over the Southern Hemisphere, all this high frequency ASV is related to the middle latitude wave train. For Low frequency variabilities, MGO directly link this Asian Australia monsoon. Okay. Now, meanwhile, MGO also excited a couple of the current wave, which propagate eastward to affect the American monsoon and Africa monsoon. And the South American monsoon is, is additionally affected by the abindelated wave train. Now, if we look at the last 40 years, how does the intra-seasonal variability has changed? Okay. Now we see the intensification mainly in the South Asia monsoon, East Asia monsoon, and Australia monsoon. Meanwhile, American monsoon, the high frequency 
uh, variability is reduced. The low frequency variability has a similar pattern. The East Asia, South Asia, Australia monsoon increase, but South America is decreased. Okay. Now, why is that? Because in those regions, the low frequency variability uh, is more important than other regions. That is why the uh, the oh, this is uh, sorry. The last section is of the prediction scale. The prediction scale. We look at the twelve models, multi-model ensemble. They show higher frequency uh, scales in Australia monsoon, South Asia monsoon, and South America monsoon. Those places are the MGO scale uh, variability is larger than other regions. Okay, so uh, I uh, the time limit I can only very quickly review those. So I hope that uh, I'm just taking twenty minutes. So I want to stop here to have your comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bingwai. And uh, now we'll uh, go to the next speaker's presentation. Uh, before that, I'll just introduce the speaker. So Anarsa Chassi is a senior scientist at the Institute of the Atmospheric Sciences and Climate from the National Research Council in Bologna, Italy. She got a PhD in geophysics at Bologna University in 2004. She now has almost 20 years of experience in climate variability and climate change studies, specifically focusing on the tropics, the monsoons, and the related teleconnections. She has recently contributed to the IPCC AR6 report as a lead author. She is currently a member of the Clever GX Monsoons Panel and the working group two of the WCRP EPSC, explaining and predicting air system change, lighthouse activity. She is a very active member of the panel and contributes to the GPEX program as well. So, Dr. Analisa will be talking about uh, monsoons in the future, the climate change perspective, starting from the latest IPCC outcomes and subsequent literature, providing a global view of the changes. She also explores current understanding and possible future perspectives of the impact of global monsoon knowledge. Analisa, please start your talk. So just to inform everyone that please drop your Q and A's in the question box so that we'll take up all the questions after analysis completes their talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Surya. Thank you for um, asking me to give this presentation here. And it is, um, I would say, quite an honor to be after Professor Wang and this very um, exhaustive um, uh, presentation uh, of the government soon. So I will put it in presentation mode. You should see it, right? Okay, so my talk is about the future of monsoon in a changing climate, keeping um, a global uh, perspective. I have organized uh, my presentation into um, a description of uh, how the global monsoon and the future of the global monsoon has been assessed in the APCC Air 6 report. Uh, also, uh, something about the extreme and other characteristics uh, related to the monsoon projection. I will talk also about the decomposition of precip precipitation changes, uh, thinking of how this uh, has been used uh, in the past years, also in sensitivity experiment, and then applied to projection. And then I will provide a summary and some outlook about uh, uh, this topic. So in the uh, IPCC AR6 report, the global and regional monsoon have been treated, have been assessed uh, uh, in the whole um, uh, report, and it has been organized uh, in the different uh, chapters. For example, the global monsoon has been treated in the chapter two, three, and four, according to the observed and past changes to the attribution to, to the human influence on the changes and uh, with respect to the uh, future uh, changes based on the projection, either in the near, midterm, and long-term changes. While the original monsoons has been assessed in chapter eight, that was a chapter dedicated to the water cycle changes, 
Nevertheless, there are also other region by region assessment associated with case studies, extremes, and impacts that have been distributed in other chapters like chapter 10, 11, 12, and also the atlas and the interactive atlas that are dedicated to regional information, where regional refer to the, uh, the, the IR6 region as they've been identified and, and uh, uh, in, the, in the assessment. As the, all the information were spread out uh, around, the, um, uh, around the report, uh, um, there is a monsoon, there is a box in the technical summaries that uh, tends to summarize all the assessment uh, that has been included in the, in the chapter. And there is also an annex where we where some details, uh, review background uh, of the monsoon that were not supposed to be part of the recent assessment but we are useful for uh, a clear understanding have been included. This is just a picture of one of the of the last meetings that we had in person uh, for the IPCC, just to say that, uh, of course, the IPCC is a teamwork and also uh, part of this people in this picture have contributed to the uh, assessment of the monsoon. So I start with this picture that is also the picture that is used in the uh, monsoon panel description where um, there is the uh, identification of the global monsoon as the contour, the black contour that uh, uh, Professor Wang has just described um, extensively. And here is defined as the area with the local summer minus winter precipitation rate exceeding 2.5 millimeter per day. Um, this black contour encompasses uh, regional um, regions where regional monsoon are located. But in the report, it has been decided that the regional monsoon regions were supposed to be identified also in the established literature about that specific regions. And there are, for example, regions that are here with the dots where um, that are part of the global monsoon picture, but have not uh, uh, have not any a, a literature per se about as, and are not yet recognized as a singular monsoon system in terms of, uh, I mean, available literature and establishment of definition. So, uh, in terms of how the um, state of the art uh, climate models are able to uh, represent the monsoon domain as in precipitation intent. Intensity, intensity in the top, there is the, uh, um, the picture of the precipitation, the season, the seasonality of precipitation for the observation and for the models. And there is also the monsoon domain that is um, identified with the magenta lines. And uh, uh, this identifies a holistic representation of the monsoon domain and of the precipitation intensity. In terms of uh, um, variation and in terms of percentage of changes as they are represented in the panels C of the uh, summer monsoon precipitation average over the global land uh, monsoon area, there are periods of declining and then recoveries of observations that are present at the observation, but also in the model. So, uh, and the same, of course, for the Northern Hemisphere summer monsoon circulation. In terms of attribution of what can be the monsoon precipitation changes, this is an example taken from a, a paper published by Du and colleague in 2020, where there are a, a bunch of CIMIP-5 models experiment where um, the uh, multimodal ensemble mean, including all the forces, is able to reproduce the trend, the precipitation trend in 1948-2005, that is the, the, the plot in B, compared to A. But then if we want to see what are the atmospheric forces that contribute the most to this trend, and we are talking here about the northern hemisphere summer, uh, we see that it is the anthropogenic aerosol, while the uh, greenhouse gases would provide an increase in the precipitation. And this is ends up also in the attribution of monsoon precipitation changes. So we go back to the definition that we have uh, that has been used in the assessment, and we look at the global monsoon on the right of this whiskers plot. Um, we see how the trend in precipitation using the dummy simulation that have been uh, part of the CIMIP-6 framework, uh, we see that uh, the uh, all four things that is the violet uh, um, symbol have a small increase in terms of global monsoon, 
um, that is the combination of an increase that would be associated to the greenhouse gases and the decrease associated to the anthropogenic area. So the global monsoon signal follows and it is mostly in line with the uh, largest changes that occur for the Asian monsoon, so the South Asian, the East Asian, and also the Australian monsoon, while for the other regions, there are probably larger spread and also not always the same kind of direct, uh, direct behavior. If we look at the future uh, of uh, uh, global monsoon changes, either in terms of precipitation and circulation, so then we, we keep the historical period and we uh, consider the uh, scenarios that has been used in the, uh, in the IPCC, and we look at the percentage of change with respect to the period 1995-2014, um, what we see is that in the long term, the global land monsoon precipitation is projected to increase by 1.3, 2.5% of increase per degree of, of global warming. And this occurred despite the uh, monsoon circulation is projected to weaken. In the near term, the changes uh, in the global monsoon and also the circulation that is associated with these changes are largely affected by the combined effects associated with the modern uncertainty and to the internal variability that together are somehow larger than the forced signal. Uh, looking at the future in this whiskers plot, taking uh, one scenario as an uh, example, like the, the SSP2 4.5 scenario, and looking at the change in the future uh, as percentage of change in the near term, mid term, and long term, defined at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the 21st century, we see that the global monsoon has the uh, progress increase. So the most the, um, um, the scenario is high, the largest is the global monsoon increase. And this increase is uh, uh, related with the fact that the, um, the, the greenhouse gases response, the response to greenhouse gases increase dominate the change. And it's also associated to the largest changes that occur in the South Asian, East Asian, and Australian monsoon, where the, 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 the trend is clear. So the change is largest as largest is the forcing. Um, while again, there are other monsoon regions where the, the changes um, is not so large in terms of increase, can, can, be, can have also a decrease. There are some non-linearity and there is larger spread. So there are uncertainties in terms of how the models represent these changes. So I want to spend a few words here on the decomposition of precipitation changes. Uh, Professor Wang already uh, introduced this concept and uh, provided uh, more detail on this. This was a, a um, a departure from precipitation that has been uh, um, used following the budget decomposition of the precipitation. I used this long time ago in a paper that appeared in 2011 in climate dynamics. And at the time, uh, so the distinction was about a term that was associated with the changes in moisture a term omega term change associated with the change in, in omega and then adoption and evaporation change. Uh, what was found in this uh, uh, paper, and that was done in sensitivity experiment where the carbon dioxide concentration was multiplied by factor 2, 4, and 16, that was a quite extreme kind of, uh, um, of, of scenario, and it was uh, divided for the different region, and in all the regions, uh, the thermodynamic component, I mean the Q term, was positive, and in most of the cases it was the largest contribution to the increase. But there were also uh, this increase were dumped out by the effect of the omega term and the advection terms that uh, could have been also important in some regions. One thing that came out from this analysis and distinction, even if it was quite uh, in terms of quite uh, uh, idealized in terms of kind of experiment was uh, a distinction between two categories. So the Asian monsoon from one side to the where dominated by the Q term and the other monsoon regions that were dominated by the other terms. And it also identified some nonlinearities in the changes, but again, this was quite the sensitivity type of experiment. 
something similar has been published later on. Uh, again, this moisture budget in a similar form uh, for the uh, global monsoon precipitation and global warming. In this case, again, some sort of sensitivity experiments. These were um, AMIP experiment with very high resolution atmospheric model, uh, but with SST prescribed. And again, uh, the effect of moisture and evaporation increase was uh, identified to be offset by the weakening of the monsoon circulation. In a comprehensive work that appeared in 2013, where the global monsoon and also the regional monsoon were um, analyzed in the simplified model scenarios, it was similar conclusions were, were drawn. Um, then this decomposition was uh, um, used for the CMIP-6, something similar again for the global land monsoon. Um, there is the term that is associated with the changes in moisture that dominates and is the, the, the main responsible for uh, the increase in precipitation. This is uh, a paper published in 2020 and this was just one scenario. Um, and again, you see the, the, the differences, I mean, the, the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere as a similar, have a similar behavior. And also looking at the uh, relationship between the terms of this decomposition and the changes in the precipitation, but divided into the different uh, periods of the 21st centuries, there is again a global land monsoon precipitation increase that is associated with the Q term, so to the increased moisture, and then and that is partly offset by a weakened circulation. In this case, the most we go uh, in the future to the largest is the uh, uncertainty that we have in the projection, as as usual. And also there is uncertainty in the subdomain precipitation projection that is uh, generally larger than what happens for the global land monsoon precipitation. Looking at future, uh, future changes in some characteristics of the rainy season, like the duration, um, there is a highly positive correlation with the relative increase in the amount of precipitation per one degree of temperature increase this is meaning that the largest precipitation increase is associated with longer monsoon season. We have here the example of the changes in the duration in pentads of the rainy season uh, in uh, the different uh, monsoon regions. You see the colors and the, uh, the acronyms in the, in, the, in the scatter plot. So the change in duration with respect to the ratio between the change in precipitation per degree of warming in three different scenarios. And what appears is that the Asian monsoons have the largest increase in precipitation and the longest duration in the projection. And we see also that the American and African monsoon tends to have a shortening of the monsoon rainy season. Something similar has been applied to the CIMIP-5 model in terms of the definition of onset, retreat, and duration of the monsoon season for the global monsoon in the top panel and for the other um, monsoon regions. Um, and again, uh, in that also in that scenario, in those scenarios, there were a retreat dates that were delayed, um, and there was a, a result in a lengthening of the monsoon season that was mostly evident for the East Asian monsoon, and in general for the Asian monsoon than for the other. Uh, than for the other regions. And again, the highest scenarios as the highest uncertainties in terms of the response of the model. And here is the same, but focused on, but considering the global monsoon on the right of each, um, of each plot and a focus on some uh, Asian, on the Asian monsoons and the results are similar. Um, so for the East Asian, it is clear a lengthening of the delayed end of the month, uh, of the season associated with the delayed end of the monsoon. And in the majority of the Asian subregional monsoon, the future changes of the rainy season are larger than the, those over the global monsoon. But also in this case, apart for the duration, there is generally a large spread among the models. 
And then in terms of extremists, also uh, Professor Wang has mentioned, there is a clear signal that in the future, in the projection, extreme precipitation over the monsoon region are projected to increase. This is true also in what has been observed in uh, some uh, um, station with very long record of, uh, uh, of precipitation. And you see for the global monsoon in the top, in the, the plot on the on the left, and also for the other for the other regions, uh, and also in the projection, uh, there is a large spread among the models, and the 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 the, the, the matrix where the, the the spread is the lowest is the twenty-year return value of precipitation. But anyway, there is an indication of an increase of the extreme events. So I have here uh, some conclusions, some summary of what I have shown, just uh, um, putting the attention on the fact that there are um, uh, changes in the global monsoon that in most of the cases are dominated by what happens for, to the northern hemisphere monsoon, that uh, in most cases the changes for the Asian monsoon are clearer and with the least uh, um, uncertainties with respect to the other, uh, to the other monsoon region. And this is true for many different metrics and parameters that have been, been considered. And I want just to uh, include some outlook uh, for the future of monsoon in a changing climate thinking at a global perspective, but without forgetting the regional details. And uh, this becomes important when we want to see uh, how we can use the global monsoon metrics without losing the details uh, of the region, mostly when we deal with the policy relevant information. That there is also attention to be, to be that we need to, to have attention and there is need of more understanding of the uncertainties in climate change projections. So what is the role of internal variability? And we have seen from the, um, what also Professor Wang has shown, how this difference can change depending on the type of variability that we consider. And again, what are the differences and how we understand and can use the, the differences that exist between the Asian monsoons and the other regions. Also some attention has to be driven to the zonal asymmetry. So, in terms of uh, scenarios where there are abrupt changes like in AMOC in uh, uh, shutdown or where there are a huge volcano. So there will be asymmetries in the change that would have been considered and understood. And also in, uh, another point uh, about how to link and deal with this theoretical understanding with the dynamical view of the monsoon, thinking of the aquaplanet frames that have been used, for example, in this quite interesting review provided by Gein and Cortus in 2024 about the differences between ITCZ and monsoon regimes. So I thank you for the attention and I'm uh, happy uh, for questions and discussion uh, to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Anarisa. Now we'll start the Q&A session. So we have some questions to Professor Binway. So I will read it for you, Professor Binway. Maybe we can answer them orally at this moment. And if you find some time afterwards, you can answer some of other questions that cannot be covered here. So there is one question from James Renwick. He is uh, thanking for great presentation. And this question is, how do you see dynamical changes and changes in erosion loadings playing out in future in terms of their relative importance? Okay, thank you for the questions. I think I discussed the anthropogenic forcing effect. The, um, the aerosol effect, <clears throat> because of the emission in the Northern Hemisphere. So they tend to cool Northern Hemisphere more than the Southern Hemisphere. So in that sense, their effect on the global monsoon is uh, is probably opposite to the, uh, the greenhouse gas effect. In, this is just a <clears throat> very um, general considerations. There is a paper published recently 
to discuss the aerosol effect on the global monsoon change. I think particularly uh, relevant to answer these questions, your questions. Okay, thank you. There is uh, another question by Padsardi Mukhopajaya. So his question is that, if ISV is increasing and extreme rainfall events are increasing, particularly our uh, South Asian mm -hmm. if ISV, you have ISV is interseasonal variability. I'm sorry, we, which question? Yeah, there is a question from Adhasabhi Mukhopajaya. I know it is not, he is unable to post it in Q&A session. So that's why I'm asking you from the chat box. The chat box chat. has a question, yes. I didn't okay. quite get the question. Okay, so then I will go to the other one. So T from Monsoon's panel, uh, she's asking uh, about the two factors. One is Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere warming contrast to land versus sea warming. Invoke to, invoke to explain regional monsoon differences under global warming scenario. They are basically the same origin, right? That okay. Northern Hemisphere has more land than Southern Hemisphere, or is referring to some kind of asymmetrical distribution of greenhouse gases emissions. There is some linkage between these two because uh, the land area, Northern Hemisphere, is much larger than Southern Hemisphere. Um, the difference is that, uh, for example, you reaching continent is a big land mass, which the land ocean thermal contrast effect um, can enhance the Asian monsoon and the North Africa monsoon. On the other hand, in the Central America or North America regions, the land bridge is very narrow. So the land sea thermal contrast is not important. In that case, um, it doesn't really uh, matter. What matters is the SST gradient between the equatorial Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, whether they generate the circulation favorable for the monsoon circulation enhanced or not. Uh, so there is a linkage, but there is a difference also. Thank you. Uh, there is one question from Professor Govinda Swami Bala. So he, he says that if ENSO causes a decrease in global tropical monsoon precipitation, does it cause an increase in extratropical precipitation? I would expect an increase in the extratropical precipitation as the overall atmospheric heating increases in an ENSO year. Yeah, to answer this question is that uh, I'm not quite sure because what we know is the coupling between the monsoon area and the subtropical dry area. So if uh, <clears throat> if monsoon rainfall decrease during the El Nino development summer, the dry region, subtropical dry regions crop probably will slightly increase. What happened in the middle latitude, I don't exactly know. They have to be looked at more carefully how the middle latitude rainfall uh, responds to the tropical uh, El Nino frozen. Uh, so far, I think is clear signal in the tropics, but in the extra tropics, their response to uh, the El Nino normally start, uh, depends upon the teleconnection patterns. Okay, During northern winter, this teleconnection PNA patterns can we the ENSO impact to the Northern Hampshire winter? But during summer is tricky. El Nino is a developing stage. The amplitude of anomaly is not that large. So they basically change the worker circulation, then through exciting the Rossby waves outside of the equatorial region to affect the monsoon, tropical monsoon or subtropical monsoon region. But as as far as the middle latitude, I'm not sure. I I don't know. Okay. So there is a, another uh, follow-up question from same uh, Goin Swami Bala. 
So is persistent warming in the eastern Pacific is the main cause for decrease in North American monsoon rainfall under global warming or any other cause? Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's at the uh, Central America, Mexican regions uh, is uh, surrounded by both Pacific and, and Atlantic. So the Atlantic Ocean SSD change could also affect the North America or Central America monsoon. So this uh, equatorial uh, Pacific, Eastern Pacific SST is not the single or uh, or full factors. I, I think what happened is that you have to look at the SST gradient between the Eastern Pacific and the tropical Atlantic. And how does this gradient affect the circulation, cyclonic circulation or anti-cyclonic circulation? How does they change the boundary of moisture convergence? So that uh, uh, I, I believe this SSC variability in the both ocean are, are important, need to be looked at more carefully. Uh, there is another question from Prasad Mukhopaj. It may not be a question actually, it is a comment, glaciers in the eastern and central regions of the Himalayas appear to be retreating at rates that have accelerated over the past century and are comparable to those in other parts of the world. In the western Himalayas, glaciers are more stable and may even be increasing in size. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah, this is, this is an observed effect. I think uh, is generally true. But uh, uh, in the global warming scenario, in the highland area, the, the warming may be more than the surrounding regions. So it will continue. But the question is why those Northwest uh, Tibetan Plateau, uh, the glaciers does not significant, is not significantly changing. Well, in the Southeast part is, uh, is more rapidly melting. This is a, a science questions that need to be need to be addressed. There must be some different climate background uh, um, affect those. And and another aspect that we we need to enhance the evapori uh, the the observations over those highland regions. We really don't know exactly how much precipitation even over those highland regions and uh, the growth and the melting uh, dynamics of the glacier need to be further studied. But anyway, uh, there is no specific question. So <laughs> I just uh, uh, make uh, some general comments. There is a question from Ushan Shudatta, is a young colleague of uh, IATM. What he has noticed in his recent paper is that the ENSO monsoon, monsoon means South Asian monsoon, relation is weak during the period 81 to 2010. However, mm -hmm. what he is that the uh, strength of these clouds uh, is very strong. Mm -hmm. One side, the relation is weakening, ENSO monsoon relation, but the convective activity or uh, the clouds are becoming very strong. And you mm. Yeah, I think the teleconnection from uh, monsoon heat source, Indian monsoon, for example, is determined by the latent heat released in the monsoon rainfall. If the monsoon rainfall reduced, the latent heat release reduced, its teleconnections uh, start from the Central Asia downstream along the jet stream <laughs> will be weaker. However, the clause is another thing. Some of the clouds may not be precipitable. So increased clouds does not necessarily mean increased precipitation or latent heating release. So I think these two things are not necessarily contradictory to each other. You can have a weakening teleconnection because of the weakening of precipitation heating, 
you can also have uh, increased cloudiness because those clouds could be non-precipitating clouds due to aerosol effect or whatever. So uh, they may be both true or not, dic not a contradictionary. Okay, so, uh, so I do have some, myself being the moderator, I want to ask you some couple of questions. See, uh, one thing that uh, you have shown is that uh, there is a asymmetry in the ISV trend in recent decades that we have shown in one of your pictures. What I see is that in the Eastern Hemisphere, the ISV is increasing, whereas in the Western Hemisphere, it is decreasing mostly. Is there any reason for this, or? Oh, this is a, this is a really good question. So, uh, I'm I'm currently uh, investigate why after two thousand there is a decade of change of of the intra-seasonal variability in the East Asia and Asian monsoon regions. Um, it has to do with the, the I think with to do with the mean state change. Uh, what happened is after 1999, the, the Pacific mean state tends to be cooler in the Eastern Pacific and the Indo-Pacific warm pool SST anomaly tends to be increased much uh, significant. So that change of large scale SST pattern uh, certainly favors for the increase of convective activity in the Eastern Hemisphere. And that is a background for MGO or the higher frequency ISO disturbance development. So that could be a reason why in the, um, in the Asian Australia monsoon regions, the ISV uh, variability increase. Or, and why the North American monsoon regions tends to decrease, but why the South, South American monsoon uh, is is probably has additional regional reasons need to be further studied. I I'm not sure. Yeah. So I think now we'll uh, move to analysis. So one of the questions that Krishnan uh, is asking you is that, what is the confidence in these projections of the circulation patterns? Yeah, the, the confidence uh, for the uh, changes in circulation are, um, I think that we are defined as medium confidence that there are some uh, spread among how the models respond to, this, to these changes. And some differences are in the near term where the internal variability dominates the change. So that's where there is the largest uncertainty and the largest spread. Then going toward the longer term projection, then this role of the internal variability decreases and then uh, it becomes more, um, more certain, but still the, the confidence is, is around the medium confidence because of the internal variability in the mid term. Okay, so from uh, there is uh, another question from let me see, Elpen. Uh, what are the main projections for the winter Asian monsoon, and do we know to what extent extreme events predict in summer may impact winter monsoon or transition season in terms of hydrology, temperature, etc. Okay, um, unfortunately, I don't have an um, answer for these questions. Um, so there is, uh, I don't remember a specific treatment of the winter region monsoon. So what are the, um, the main assessments that have been highlighted also relate to the annual changes. So in that, uh, uh, but specific for the winter, I'm sorry, but I don't have, um, I don't have an answer, I'm sorry. So there, from Neil, there is a question to you, Analisa. Thanks for a great summary of the AR6 technical summary and more recent publications. Are risks, risks, uh, risks of uh, shortened monsoon season in South Asian monsoon or South African monsoon discussed? 
also present presented in AR6, similar the season lengthening in other regions. It seems from what you showed that AR6 focus on four months on season precipitation change. So for the um, for the South Americans and uh, for the American and African monsoon, um, the changes in the uh, the length of the season are uh, less uh, robust uh, with respect to what happens for the Asian monsoon. Um, so it is not clear if uh, there will be a, an increase in the in the length of the season or a decrease. There were some for the West Africa monsoon. There were some uh, um, uh, descriptions that uh, was distinguishing the the west and eastern part of the West Africa, uh, but for the other region, the signal is not robust in the model, so there is not a clear identification of an increase in the length of the season or a decrease. Okay, so there is another question maybe either one of you can take it. In the coming future, solar insulation is about to reach its minimal value. Given that external forcing, what will be the response of monsoons to the internal forcing? This is from Paninder Reddy, a young colleague of again from IIT. Professor Bidwan, you want to answer that? Yeah. The monsoon response to uh, greenhouse gas forcing and the solar forcing are very different. I have mentioned for greenhouse gas forcing, it stabilizes atmosphere. But for solar forcing, if they change, they, uh, they heat the surface first. So they are not really affect atmosphere static stability. And that is important because in terms of the circulation change, um, the atmospheric static stability can, can reduce the circulation change for, for the greenhouse gas, but the solar radiation forcing it will not. And that can cause the atmosphere ocean interaction behaves differently. Uh, in the Pacific in particular, the mean steady change, for example, if you have a weakened worker circulation first, then you can trigger this uh, vehicle's feedback process. You have a weakening trade wind, then you have, uh, uh, you, you have westerly anomalies that will stimulate the East Pacific warming. So the feedback eventually leading to our El Nino-like mean state for Solar force, for example, the, the, it does not change the circulation, the static stability, not circulation first, but the ocean can respond to the uh, surface warming through solar radiation change. Uh, in the Eastern Pacific, because the up valley is dominant, so the suit it, it is insensitive to the solar force. But in the West Pacific warm pool regions, the ocean dynamics uh, plays less important role. And the SST is sensitive to the surface heat flux exchange, especially solar radiation frozen. So therefore, the West Pacific could be warming first. And once it warm, uh, uh, the response the triggered air sea interaction can lead into a different the mean state change. And once the SST pattern changed, the uh, the global atmosphere circulation will respond, especially the monsoon circulation will respond. So in future change, we have to consider both the uh, the solar force and change and the greenhouse gas change, but they are the process, they are affect the monsoons are different. So we have to pay attention to that part uh, also. Uh, it's just a very general yeah. thinking. So Analisa, this is for you. I think it came in, uh, came from Muhammad Amjad in the chat box. 
So this question is, how do you think IPCC interactive at class may be used to study future changes in monsoon? Um, uh, so the interactive atlas has, uh, um, is organized into the regions on how the globe has been divided and decided to be divided uh, within the IPCC. So we have the IPCC air six regions but they are not uh, exactly coinciding with the monsoon region. So, uh, so what is the assessment about the regional future monsoon changes is in the chapter eight. And there are also something probably uh, some more details in uh, the region in the Atlas, but the interactive Atlas per se, per se um, has not the exact definition of the monsoon region, if I recall correctly. If it does, yes, you can produce the figures using this uh, regional definition, and but only for some variables like precipitation, temperature, and so. Okay, so there is a Professor Binwang. There is a question to you from Naga Lakshmi. So I think there is some confusion in the question, but I will put it to you. The monsoon and so relationship is changing most of that time, whereas you mentioned that Astral monsoon and Enso relation is remaining same. So actually the question is something different. I'm trying to make sense of that. So is there any reason why it is so stationary for Astral monsoon? Uh, for India monsoon after 1970, late 70s, actually the monsoon Enso relation was weakening. But after 2000, it start to recover. Um, so normally the people don't think the Indian monsoon and Enso relationship has been increased in the recent four decades. However, if you look at the East Asia monsoon, Australia monsoon, and, uh, and other places, the their correlation with ENSO tends to be uh, increasing. I think this uh, not necessarily due to the anthropogenic forcing induced global warming. It could have uh, something to do with the multi-decadal variability of the global SST mode, including the mean state change. In the, in the Pacific Ocean, especially the IPOs and the North Atlantic NAO or, or um, multi-decadal uh, variability of Atlantic Ocean. So exactly speaking, beside those uh, large scale background has effect, we have to consider UNSO property change itself, uh, especially there is a more like a central Pacific mm, warming type of El Nino or El Nino model K uh, or CP El Nino. And in the last 40 years, the El Nino um, has changed the property dramatically. For example, the response on carpenters scenario is warming start East Pacific. They propagate westward. This type of event called EP type event. But in the last 40 years, those East Pacific El Nino event almost disappear. And because of the Indian Pacific warm pool warming rapidly, so most of the El Nino start from the Dateline or West Pacific. So they end up with uh, either Central Pacific El Nino or very strong Super El Nino if they couple with uh, MGO event, the triggering the basin-wide development. Although they, during winter time, they move to the Eastern Pacific, but they originally, a star from the West Pacific. And that is a summer monsoon, North Hemisphere summer monsoon being affected. So I think both the change of ENSO mean state and ENSO property itself can 
can account for a large part of the change of the uh, Enso Monsoon regional monsoon relationship. But exactly speaking, you have to look at each of the regional monsoon, which which factors may be more important than others. And there could be other factors from extra tropics, from other basins, so-called interbasin interactions. You have to look at the Indian Ocean, you have to look at <clears throat> dipole mode. How does this change? And, and, and all those factors, uh, if we consider them together, maybe can get some clue how to explain this regional monsoon and so relationship change. Okay, so I wish to thank both of you for taking the questions. There are still some unanswered questions in the Q and A. Please take time and answer them because short is of time. Uh, I wanted to conclude this session by thanking all the people who are involved in organizing this webinar. So first and foremost, the speakers for readily agreeing to our request to deliver these talks. And the talks are really engaged, engaging and very informative. Thanks to Professor Binwan and thanks to Nalisa for readily agreeing and taking up this uh, task. So uh, then, WCRP, WWRP logistic team had really actually WCRP, WMO logistic team, Fernando mostly has worked behind the scene for arranging this Zoom meeting for all of us to interact. And thanks to the WMO logistics team for arranging this meeting. And if I don't say anything about Hindumati and Usha from WSRP team, it is not complete. Actually, they are the ones who have really pushed the monsoons panel that you should have the webinar series and the outreach activity can really increase by having this webinar series. And thank you both Indumati and Ushan for walking us through this whole activity. And IMPO, the International Monsoon Project Office led by Dr. Raj Gopal and his team has really helped us in been things in spite of our busy schedules, he kept on pushing this and pulling towards this to achieve and finally realizing this webinar series. So there is a organizing committee of webinar uh, series that includes myself and uh, Laila, co-chairs of the Monsoons panel and WCRP, WWRP team and MP members. They, all of them are really working to make sure that other webinar series on regional monsoons also come up, comes up and happens in time. Last but not the least, the participants are actively engaging in these discussions and also posting some very important questions. In any case, this webinar will be hosted as mentioned uh, in the, by Indumati on the WCRP YouTube channel and IIT YouTube channel and also some more uh, channels, maybe it, it is available. So you can always drop in your questions there as well. So, and both the speakers, Professor Bin Wang and uh, Dr. Analisa have agreed that they will answer them whenever they find some free time. So thanks to all of you. And I really enjoyed this webinar. Thank you. Thank you thanks. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Very stimulating. Actually, the time is not sufficient. Otherwise, we would have some more person and answer session. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs>